important to know, and the Institute recognizes that. And while it's not, I wouldn't say, a core piece of the curriculum, they're certainly building it um, into the quantitative section. Thank you very much. Welcome. Don't be, don't be shy. Yeah, there's got to be more than two questions. Here we go. We got it. Hello, um, my name is Ashley Cook, and I'm a student at the University of Akron. <clears throat> I was looking to take the CSU course in the fall. Would you recommend taking the level one that December, or waiting until the June, so you'd have more time to do some of the more uh, prep for that? Uh, personally, I would recommend taking it in June. I think it would give you a little extra time to do some practice tests, but it's more of a personal decision. Okay. I, I, would, I would echo that, and, and, and the reason that if you're planning on taking the tests successively, and you take the first one in December, you don't find out your results until January. They've actually sped it up a, a bit, so it's, it's better now than it used to be. But you don't find out your results until mid-January. It used to be February. And you had to hurry up and sign up for the exam by, I think the, the deadline is March. I did the December exam uh, the first time it passed, and then signed up for the second exam. Didn't get my results back. Now, I, I was moving and, and things, and signed up for the second exam uh, the last day that I could. And I didn't study the curriculum at all. I didn't have time with the move and taking a new job, et cetera, uh, and took the exam just to take it. But I can tell you that the, the amount of time spent in the crunch, it really wears on you. Going from taking one exam and studying, the, you know, doing the 10 hours a week and the weekends, and then doing it just starting over in January, what well, you should start over in January, mm -hmm. that becomes very difficult. So if, if, if I had a, to suggest, I would take it June, June, June. I okay. think you give your chance the best, the best chance to succeed uh, for the second level, and it limits burnout. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, um, my name is Amog, and I'm a second year MBA at Weather School of Management, Case Western Reserve University. I'm uh, a CFA level two candidate as well. Um, when I talk to my seniors in uh, investment management industry or some of the other professionals, they tell me these, this thing very often these days that the investment industry is moving towards you know, model-based uh, investment strategy a lot, like there are preset models and you kind of invest according to it. Um, I just get a feel that at this kind of situation, probably uh, a CFA candidate or CFA charter holder might lose his value. What are your thoughts on this? And I would just touch on that at the level three curriculum, which I'm currently studying, really does focus on behavioral finance and has a strong focus on uh, modern investments. So I would say that they've been able to uh, convert the curriculum to cover uh, what you're referring to. Uh, I, guess to uh, I guess to comment on that, I might, might disagree with that, or I do disagree with that, because it is certainly the trend is moving towards modeling, if, I'm, if your question yeah. is around that. But, uh, you know, I just go back during my tenure in the profession, I, I heard the same things when the, the indexing took hold back in the uh, 90s. I could buy an S&P index, what do I need a CFA or a portfolio manager for? Uh, I'm going to do it myself. And there, there's always value uh, that can be added in any situation, whatever your role is. And again, this industry, it, it, it's no different than it was 25 or 50 years ago. It's based on fine, uh, sound financial concepts. Right. And uh, so I, I think given what's unfolding, you know, things have a tendency to move in uh, phases. And uh, I would not let, the, let that discourage you in any way. And, and I'd like to add, I don't work on the investment side of the house, so I, I can't necessarily answer your question per se, but when it comes to the value of the charter, what I will say is that it's not just about what you're reading in the books or your abilities. You could read the curriculum, you could pass the exams, and maybe just decide not to. But the one thing that the Institute preaches, and it's at the top of their list, is, is ethics and fair markets. Right. And it pushes that members understand what it means to be fair. They're held to the utmost standards when it comes to ethics. And I can tell you that, it, that if I'm selecting a money manager and I want someone to manage my money, I'm maybe not looking for someone who got a 4.0 or can completely tell me everything that they learned about the curriculum. I'm choosing that person because I know that they're ethical. I know that they have standards, the highest standards. Uh, and I also know that 
when they're making a decision on the investment side of the house, that they've done their due diligence. I'm not, I'm not as concerned walking away and leaving my money with that person. And I'd, I'd like to think, and maybe as you walk around today, you can talk to some of the employers here and see what they say as, as they see a candidate's or a charter holder's resume past their desk, what that means to them. But I think the Institute's made it clear that it's, it's about ethics and it's about the highest standards, not just the investment fundamentals. And that's, that's certainly a core of the exam, but it's, it's high standards. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for, for one or two more questions, if, if anyone would like to ask. Good afternoon. My name is Mama. I would like to know if you have uh, any idea about uh, uh, the African side, like uh, the uh, CFA in Africa, how do they do over there? Do you have any idea? I would say uh, just a couple examples. Um, I'm a Weatherhead alum, and I did have a couple classmates who are from Africa, and they pursued the CFA designation, um, obtained it, moved back to Nigeria, and they're doing very well in investment uh, houses there. And so I would imagine that it has the same sort of a strong um, criteria and standards uh, and reputation there as well. So I was going to add, what I, what I found to be particularly exciting, if you go to the CFA website, in cfainstitute.org, and you look at the, um, the material that's out there, the webcasts and the, uh, the white papers, there's a lot of material in there on the frontier markets, Africa, the Middle East, there's a lot of things going on in those markets, and I know the CFA is very active in that area, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, I will be not uh, interested just on like a uh, holding or uh, handling or managing a portfolio, but uh, I know that the one side of Africa, like the, the, the southern part, they have uh, an existing kind of security market. Okay. But I'm kind of uh, uh, wondering if anybody got the idea of extending it to, uh, throughout the rest of the continent. It's a, it's a part of my personal feeling, my ambition. I, by some people that I can be referred to in order to accomplish that task. I personally can't answer that question for you because I, I don't know. Um, but like Paul, I, I worked with someone at Key Bank uh, who was from Africa and, and recently moved back, and she is a charter holder. Um, I can certainly give you her contact information. She'd be thrilled to talk to you about it, and she would be she would know much more than I do, um, and, and would be able to answer your question. Uh, if I told you anything, I would be lying, because I, I, I really don't know. I, I will only mention one more thing about how the Institute operates a, across the globe, and that is the test is standardized, and it's offered in English. So if you're going to take the exam, be prepared to take the exam in English. And the reason for that is there's, just, there's translation, translation issues, and they want everyone to take the same exact exam. So as you do go through the process, it'll be the exact same test in Africa as is here in the States. It's, there's, there's no difference. Okay, I'll get back to you after. Yes, please do. Please seek me out. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Peter Chen from Youngstown State University. Well, I teach, uh, we teach our students being ethical. However, when I read the article written by that uh, Goldman Sachs uh, executive, I was shocked. Because, uh, so my question is how, how being ethical is rewarded by the financial industry or by your bank? I mean, if there's no financial in incentive well, if the incentive is just to make money, people will just make money, not being ethical. I would say that one of the central um, tenets of the CFA Institute is to put your client first in everything that you do. The client comes before your own personal welfare. So certainly a lot of the things that were brought up in that article would be against the guidelines of the CFA. And uh, if any of those employees were CFA members, they might be subject to some sort of um, you know, uh, criticism. Yeah, but guidance is just a guidance. If you just put on the paper, paper looks beautiful. But if there's no monetary incentive, then people just fall in the profit. So, so the Institute does monitor. They have a, uh, what we call the PCR. And, and you're, every year you're going to sign this PCR, uh, which basically says that I've obeyed all rules set forth by the CFA Institute. And the CFA Institute's ethic, Code of Ethics says, that 
I will take the CFA's code of ethics and apply it, unless my employer's ethical code is more stringent, then I will use that. So you're, it is, it points out the, the most, you're to, as a charter holder, you're to use the most standard, or highest standard set forth in that situation. Uh, I question Greg Smith's motives a little bit. I thought it was great what he said uh, when he came out with that, that piece, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, listen though, Goldman Sachs is a publicly traded company. It's for profit, and the, they, they have to make money. It's, it's not a nonprofit organization. Uh, I question the extent that, that some of the um, uh, uh, what he said goes on, but I'm, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does everywhere. But that's just all the more reason to, if you're going to seek out someone to do business with, maybe you look for the, the three letters behind the name CFA, in hopes that you picked up that right person. They they've shown in the past at least. That, that they have, they lean towards the ethical side. And, and, and to Paul's point, maybe initially it doesn't help you monetarily as much because you're choosing the high ground, but I can tell you over an entire career, uh, your clients will like you much more uh, and you won't have an issue with that either. But at your bank, there's no monetary incentive to reward people being ethical at all? Uh, well, no. The, the, you know, I, 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 your, your question or comment was that there's no incentive to... Being ethical. I mean, there's no monetary... Or... Well, the, the organization I work for has a zero tolerance policy. If I operate in any unethical way, I've lost my job. Uh, again, it, it's critical, whatever profession, it's just not the financial industry. You've got you've to operate if you're going to survive. But Goldman Sachs survives just fine. I mean, they make billions of dollars ripping off their clients. Here's, here's, let me just jump in here and, and say that as, as I look around the room and I see PNC and I see KeyBank, I can tell you stories of people who um, had some indiscretions, not even with clients, but in their personal life, and it was found out at work, and they were removed immediately. Uh, we, the people in the room are good old-fashioned Midwestern core value businesses. Um, and and I, I would think that as you look at Goldman Sachs and you look at PNC or you look at KeyBank and you look at Sherwin-Williams, if you have a choice to do business, uh, perhaps that you choose KeyBank or PNC or, or one of those firms over Goldman Sachs. Uh, good people do exist. And, and I'm not going to throw Goldman Sachs on the bus for making a profit. Again, they're a publicly traded company, and that's, that's what they do. Um, but that's your choice, too. That's, I mean, that's where the consumer comes in and the research has to be done prior to making a decision. And, and when Goldman Sachs goes to do these pitches, they're not alone in the room. These individuals that are choosing Goldman Sachs to do the bond underwriting or the equity offering, they're not just pitched by Goldman Sachs or selecting them blindly. They have a chance to ask questions and figure that ethical piece out as well. So don't think that it's all Goldman Sachs. You do as a consumer, and anything that you purchase, you need to be aware of what you're getting. And I think when this comes out of Goldman Sachs, we'll see how this turns out for them. And there, you know, the reality, any company goes through an evolution. I mean, I would suggest, you know, if I, I am not a shareholder of Goldman Sachs, but they have suffered. I mean, take a look at that stock. And any other company operating, quote, unethically, they will suffer from a shareholder standpoint. And if I was a shareholder, I'm certainly going to voice my concerns. This is unacceptable. And uh, ultimately, those things have a tendency to get worked out over time. And, uh, you know, it's an evolution that takes place, in, in not only in this industry, but any industry. And, and, and don't forget what that article said. When that person joined Goldman, he was proud to be a Goldman Sachs member. It is it, something in that firm changed, the culture changed. Uh, I imagine they get back to that sooner than later because of this. Well, okay, thank you. Thank last, you. last question. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> I rose only because of the content of this last question, some of which you've addressed. I worked at Goldman Sachs for 24 years, uh, left there last year, not for reasons of this sort. I want to say un categorically, uncategorically, that, or is it a category? I want to say definitely. <laughs> uh, that is a minority experience at Goldman Sachs by far. And it doesn't mean it didn't exist. It doesn't mean that it wasn't an issue. It doesn't mean that they don't have issues to correct and, and address like any firm in any industry, as you've notably said. Uh, but it is a singular um, experience, obviously in an area of the firm that may have some difficulties. Uh, but I never had that experience in my 24 years there. I was in the research department for all that time. And, and there you go. I mean, there, there, there's your answer. Well said. 
So it, it's, it's, you just have to do your due diligence and see who you're dealing with and who you're working with. Um, again, Gold, Goldman built itself on, on, on those ethical foundations and their clients love them. And so I don't think you can take what one person says and, and, and hold that against the entire firm. It's just like someone thinking about Youngstown State. Youngstown State has a professor that says, we don't teach the right curriculum. Well, that's, you know that not to be true. But because one person says it, you do need to do your research and, and, and truly find out on your own whether or not that is indeed the case. And I think you'll find that at, at Goldman Sachs as well. So with, with that said, we have about a 15 minute break. If you hadn't had a chance to grab a box lunch or something to drink, please do so. Again, we have PNC, we have Sherwin Williams, we have Key Bank and Key Private Bank, we have Cleveland Research, uh, and we have Westfield Group. Please mingle, talk to these people. They're looking for good, solid people like yourselves. Um, and with the best outcome being that you walk away with a possible inter interview coming up or, or maybe with a job offer. So please mix, mingle, and we'll, uh, we'll get started again in about 15 minutes. Thank you.